Hey, how you doing? I hope you're doing well. You guys voted for this, and I'd honestly love to do more of these videos. Shit, man, I should listen to you more. As someone who is putting the finishing touches on a completely, mostly, somehow legal, non-profit, feature-length fan film about Jason Todd that I've been working on for way too long, causing me immense stress, depression, and ego death, I love dreaming about what I would do if the studios were stupid enough to give me an ounce of creative control over characters we love. And what better character to make a pitch for, dream about, than the character that most likely brought you and me together. So, intro's over. There'll be a sponsor in like a minute, but this is a lengthy ramble about if I wrote Spider-Man. But first, it's real easy to gain a ton of pounds when you're busy following your dreams. Trust me, I know. But you know what I really wish I had on set to stay satisfied, full, and feeling fresh? Factor. Factor is a ready-to-eat meal delivery service that makes meeting your nutrition goals easier than ever by delivering fresh, never-frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. Their team of gourmet chefs create each and every meal using ingredients with integrity to help you feel your best all day long. Skip the grocery store, fuck the cooking fatigue and outrageous cost of takeout. Instead, choose from over 35 meals a week, including options for keto, calorie, smart, vegan, veggie, and more. I've been trying to save money and my body from going broke, and I love how affordable, quick to make, and healthy all these meals taste. Roasted veggie and pesto, tortellini, jalapeno popper, burger, jalapeno lime, cheddar chicken. I was happy as could be. They got everything you and I need for a week of nutritious and delicious eats. In addition to ready-to-eat meals, they got cold-pressed juices, smoothie, energy bites, extra protein, veggie sides, and more to keep me energized during frantic times on set or in the edit. And these energy shots, dude, I swear they save me from a thousand winter bugs going around town right now. I'm not lying when I say I used Factor before they even offered to sponsor this video. Swear on Uncle Ben's life. So do yourself a favor and head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code HITOP50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Thanks guys. Listen, you saw the title, you see that clip art shoe logo, and you are immediately thinking that old Uncle Low Top would just rehash the Raimi trilogy if he got his grubby touch grass paws on Spidey. But that's the exact opposite of what I would want to do. I don't even want to attempt to touch what Sam Raimi did. His style of earnest melodrama meets sincere heroism will never be topped if you ask me. So I want to go a completely different direction. And that starts with the format. Spider-Man should be a series. I know I'm not the first person to think this, but it's insane to me that nobody has done this yet, other than like the 70s show. I get he's a billion dollar box office hit. I get he's gotta be in the Avengers movies, but to me, the character of Peter Parker has always been far better suited for television. It's why, no matter what they do in the movies, you always want to see those scenes that could not possibly fit into a two-hour runtime. By 25 minutes into Raimi's first swing, Peter has graduated high school and is living with Franco Ozcuck. By the beginning of the third film, he's about to propose to Mary Jane. Then, they screwed over Raimi and wanted to reboot and took that opportunity to send him back to high school. Because of where the stories went, Peter Parker grew up fast. And I think we always felt that if we could go back, which we have this unique opportunity, you know, to start again, that we really wanted to spend more time with Peter Parker in high school. Fast forward a couple years, and by the beginning of Mark Webb's second film, he's graduating high school yet again. Then they screwed over Webb. Really, Avi was in charge the entire time. Fast forward a couple more years, he's in the MCU and back in high school. This time, it takes him three main films, three Avengers movies, his death, his rebirth, and the Spider-Verse to have him graduate high school and end up in a shitty apartment. My long-winded point is, there are so many moments, so many growths and losses that we aren't privy to because the universe, the story, must move forward. The simple solution? Series. High budget, but not like those mostly disappointing overproduced Disney Plus series. Think something more along the lines of Arachnophoria meets Perks of Being a Wall Crawler meets the best moments of Spider-Ville. <laughs> Jesus. Something that's young, that's punky, that's youthful, modern, but with timeless themes that have kept the characters swinging. But where do we start in his life? At what point is the perfect way in? Something that we haven't seen too much of before. The first scene. Before we can see, we hear. And we hear the voice of a college kid around my or your age. Young, kind of cynical, but a sincere caringness to his voice. Yo. How are you? I mean, seriously, how are you? Nobody ever actually wants to know, right? It's just something we say so that people ask us how we are. But I want to change that, I think. And now we hear the sound of chaos slowly build, building and building through screams and slot machines. The rustle of panic consumes our ears. Fade in, a first person POV. We are small, 
We are walking, we are searching, we are seeing through the eyes of a child. We are in a palace, an arcade, a kingdom of candy and neon colors, a kingdom under attack. Parents are rushing around us as we search for hours. The arcade games that take our coins are spewing them back out at us. In between the loud golden bursts of overpriced tokens hitting the floor, we hear our voice calling out for our dad. We can't find him. We do not cut. This is a long, pretentious wonder from the viewpoint of a child. We scream out for our father, looking left and right, up and down. He is nowhere to be found. We bump into someone, a leg, a yellow pair of quilted legs. Our eyes move up to the cause of this arcade mania, the shocker. In a very classic looking costume, homemade by someone with terrible design sensibilities with an even worse name, Herman, a piss stained quilted turtle. Move, kid. But we can't move. We are frozen in fear. Somehow even the shocker is scary from this point of view. Shocker raises his gauntlets up at us. We go to darkness, closing our eyes, awaiting whatever will happen. Shit. We slowly open back up our eyes. Shocker is still there, but now his face is covered in grayish, thick, gooey webbing. We are startled still, maybe even more so. We stumble backwards, bumping into, hey Josh, a comforting voice, a voice that knows our name. We slowly turn around, a blue spandex leg. We look up, slowly revealing him in all his glory, Spider-Man. And our Spider-Man, he ain't in no high-tech suit, no advanced suit, no, 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 no. He is wearing something that's clearly been stitched together and ripped apart over and over again. Think Edge of Time meets Amazing 2. You can see the seam lines, you can see the webbing be slightly uneven, but most importantly, we, through the eyes of a child, can see Spider-Man's large and friendly eyes. Spider-Man takes a quick second to kneel down and help us back to our feet. Don't let this mean turtle scare you. He's just a big softy, ain't that right, Herman? And on our feet, Spider-Man continues to lift us up, carrying us in his arms, running towards the door. Your dad is out there, buddy. He's scared. He needs you. We continue to stare in awe as we hear Shocker rip the webbing from his face. Spider-Man sets us back down, putting his hand on our shoulder. Just head that way and I'll handle Franklin. Okay, Josh? We, the camera, Josh, nods. We hear our voice small, no older than 11. Okay, thanks, buddy. Spider-Man zips to the ceiling as we start rushing towards the exit of the arcade. We hear his quips and Shocker's grunts as we move forward. We are curious. We keep turning back as we run. We catch glimpses of the battle between between Shocker, his goons, and Spidey, never cutting, just panning back and forth as Josh moves his head. Spider-Man moves like the greatest ninja, dodging the goons' hits and Shocker's blast with grace. Our Spider-Man might be a lot more hands-off than we are used to seeing. He knows his strength could most likely punch someone through a wall, so he uses their own attacks and momentum against them. And most importantly, he never shuts up. We are still Josh, so at this point, we might not realize that Spider-Man, he's kind of a prick. Bugs Bunny on Adderall with that mouth of his. We trip again, the clumsy kid that we are. And as we trip, we look up at the ceiling and see a shocker goon go splat with the webbing being stuck to the roof looking down at us. Keep going, bud. We hear Spider-Man call out as he gets hit. We listen. When he's not roasting the bullies by being a bully, he has the most tender and empathetic voice. A voice that gives us strength. We are brave. We make it to the exit. Outside, a crowd of parents with their kids, the flashing of blinding red and blue neon cop lights assault our eyes. We rush through the crowd, riding the adrenaline high until we are scooped up. We look into our father's eyes, tears in them, as he holds on to us for dear life. We speak. It's okay, Dad. I'm here. You're safe now. Dad chuckles as we close our eyes in comfort, bringing us to our title card, Peter Parker, Spider-Man. And on our title card, we once again hear our friendly neighborhood college kid, Peter Parker. Oh, me? Yeah, man, I'm fine. Thanks for asking. So this was a very abridged version of the first scene from a script I wrote years ago, but I truly just love the idea of opening up a Spider-Man show from the viewpoint of a child. A little boy who is searching for his father, who is guided by Spider-Man. I'm a firm believer in your first scene being the summation of your themes, your character, and nothing feels more like Spider-Man to me than not only him rescuing, but inspiring a young boy to be brave and keep moving forward amidst the chaos. Anyways, if I if to continue, the one thing I think so many storytellers tend to forget is that Spider-Man 
is a drama from Peter's perspective. I've said this before, probably many times, and if I died tomorrow, I'd be dead. But if I were alive, I'd say it again. Spider-Man is not an action movie. He's not an action comic book. There is action. There's a damn lot of action. But at his core, if you go back to all my favorite stories from Ditko to De Mateus to Loeb to Bendis, all of those stories are dramas. Spider-Man is probably the greatest soap opera superhero, and I mean that with the utmost respect and love. His stories are love stories. They are stories of friendship, self-discovery, loss, compassion, guilt. You take out every single spider element and you'd still give a shit about Peter Parker trying to find himself. And the best place to showcase that element is in a serialized format. You have to have action every 20 minutes in a Spider-Man movie. You have to have an act one, an act two, and an act three in scale and scope when you are doing an animated series. But if you made a live action series, if you truly put all your heart into the characters above all, I firmly believe you could have entire episodes centered around just Peter, just MJ, just Harry, just May, with the spider antics being the B-plot. If someone could do that, I think every single one of us would be so invested in ways that some of us haven't been in a long time. Not saying I'm the guy for the job, Lord knows, you probably hate what I cooked, keep me away from that damn kitchen, but I'm just saying, this is what I would do. A drama filled with stylish action beats that are very practical, much like Daredevil or even what Mark Webb tried to do with the first Amazing Spider-Man, having real stunt performers in real locations doing superheroic feats with the utmost rawness. A drama entirely narrated by Peter Parker. And I mean that. Like I said before, he never shuts up. His voiceover is constant and he's talking directly to us. Think Mr. Robot, but funny, sincere, like he's our pal. He's a 22 Two year old broke college kid who lives in a rundown, humid clock tower attic who cannot partake even if he wanted to in the parties in the chaos of college. His spider sense hits him like an unavoidable migraine of guilt. Something bad did happen once because he refused to act and now he's physically reminded that every time something bad might happen, a metaphor for a trauma response, a panic attack that he jokingly refers to as his horrendous headache. He confesses to us what he cannot confess to those around him. We turn on the show fully knowing that Peter knows that we know that he's Spider-Man, much like how it feels to read a comic book. I think it's a very hard thing to do that in live action with most superheroes. Batman has to narrate through a notebook because why the hell would he talk to us? Not knowing exactly what's going on in Superman's head is a part of the allure, something Lois Lane must crack. But Peter wants more than anything to confess to have someone who understands him, much like we do. Spider-Man can be for young adults. Set your TV settings to TVMA, fuckos. Nah, I'm just kidding, kind of. But listen, I fully believe that you could do something different than the films by not trying to target every single demographic. I'm not saying Spider-Man is going to chop someone's head off with a car door, or that he's going to be swearing like Jordan Belfort. Absolutely fucking not. I just mean that if we are going to do a Spider-Man show in college, it has to feel, has to sound, has to be real. Mary Jane can smoke cigs, Harry can take drugs, Peter can laugh at how drunk Kenny Kong is. What made Marvel work in the first place wasn't their insistence on the comic code, but their willingness to create flawed people that felt real. I'm 24, I know and am people who drink, who smoke, who fuck up. I'm not saying we need an R-rated edge fest, man. I'm saying what's sorely lacking in a lot of Spider-Man adaptations is the reality of how young people behave. We do stupid shit, man, and Spider-Man should be surrounded by that, be a part of that, because your folks were, you are, and your kids probably will be. Peter can go to a house party and be curious about what it's like to be drunk or high, but also know that even if his body felt the effects of those substances, that he couldn't possibly try it due to how anxious he constantly is. You can play that so comedic and so relatable. The guy is a dork, one with a bit of a lofty chip on his shoulder. Peter tends to judge in his head, in his voiceover to us how sloppy we all can get. I love the idea of moving through a huge party with shitty string lights strung up everywhere while Peter Parker monologues about all the places he'd rather be, all the things he could be doing. And maybe at this point in time, since he's a little bit older, Peter is aware enough to know that his judgment is too often jealousy. How much he wishes he could just try the shit that we all try, do shit that we all regret. But because his alter ego is so defined by that regret, 
he can't. If I had any other spider media as a reference point, I'd point to the MTV show. Mature without being edge, real without being gratuitous. Max Dillon could be another college kid who aims his dicko hatred at the world, causing himself to become an electric being of anger, forcing all of us to notice him. The lizard could be a professor facing a midlife crisis, realizing how empty he is and mutating himself into something ugly. Harry could be Smallville's Lex Luthor, someone that you want to escape the abuse and neglect of his powerful father, someone that you often root for more than you do Peter. You know that he and Pete end up the best of enemies, but we really don't want that to happen. And Mary Jane? Well, to me, Mary Jane needs the spotlight. To make Mary Jane interesting, let me tell you, you don't need to make her lowest fucking lane. I'd argue that MJ, when done correctly, has just as much depth as any of the great caped love interest, if not more. She don't need to be Lois, Selena, or anywhere in between. She just needs to be Mary Jane, even if she, as a character, does not want to be. I've seen so much talk and debate about MJ in the movies, whether it's the Zendaya fans, who is a great MJ as long as the writing allows her to be, or Raimi fanboys who realize that Kirsten's MJ is the only one to have her abusive home life shown. But I want to forget all our opinions for a second and make my claim that MJ is just as important to a modern day Spidey story as Peter is. She is the co-protagonist. I write scrappy screenplays and direct diabolically depressingly cheap movies so I would never use the word deuteragonist because I'm not trying to be a tryhard prick and also if I tried to pronounce that word correctly I'd be even more of one. Point is, this Spider-Man story is just as much an MJ story, even with Pete being our narrator. We've seen the girl next door, the fiery first love and unexpected romance, but we've never seen the best friends angle. In our story, she's his longtime friend since the affordable preschool days, since the public high school and all the way to the intelligence scholarship they received to ESU. In the pilot episode, I imagine a long link later walk between the two of them that tells you all you need to know. They bounce off each other with an electricity, they finish each other's sentences, they roast each other about their un reliability. And then we get hit with a memory, one that Peter so abruptly wants to show us. I imagine a scene on a swing set. The two of them are kids swaying back and forth. It's filmed with a Super 8mm film camera. A lot of the flashbacks are. Not just because that's fucking cool, but because as we will come to see, Peter ain't just a photographer, he's a videographer. Maybe that's too much of a self-insert, should have just said filmmaker, but to be fair, Homecoming started the idea that Sony and Watts later dropped, an idea I so adore, where Peter in the modern age films shit, films himself being Spider-Man so the Daily Bugle can have exclusive viral videos. So in our story, it feels like he filmed a lot of these flashbacks, even as a kid, messing around on Ben's old Super 8 camera. And even if Peter wasn't actually filming, his memory is shown to us through that nostalgic lens. Like the memory of him and MJ on the swings as Ben watches both of them. Child MJ wants to come live with Pete. He probably wants that as well. You always want those extended sleepovers when you're young. But Peter can't understand why Mary would want to move away from her parents. He can't possibly understand what her father does when he drinks, because Ben is the perfect father, and May is the perfect mother. Mother. He doesn't know what it's like to see your dad hit your mom, and he never will. And instead of some faux force drama depicting resentment for that, you see that MJ understands that not everyone is hurting in the way she is. Maybe she did come to live with the Parkers for a while, but the endless cycle of her father getting sober only to fall off the wagon kept her bouncing back between two homes, until she was old enough to realize that her mom needed her protection. That's when Mary Jane invented, was forced to invent someone who was unburdened, carefree, entirely independent. While MJ projects that fun, that fire to the world, what she hides is the same thing that Peter hides, their pain and their longing to feel secure and help others do the same. And we, the viewer, have to feel that through not just the writing, but the directing, the casting, everything about the two needs to feel so magnetic and authentic that you do not question their admiration of each other, only long for what we know to be the end, their loving relationship. But we aren't there yet, and in order for us to care, we need to feel just as much empathy for MJ as we do for Pete. The overall season. 
Well, I don't know. To be honest, man, I never allowed myself to dream a whole season of television. What I'd like to see is such a character-focused piece on Peter, something so stylized and young with MJ right beside him. I'd like to see him meet Harry under insanely stressful circumstances. Perhaps he rescues him as Peter Parker. I don't want to completely rip off Smallville, but I also think Smallville has the perfect Harry blueprint with its take on Lex. Party boy Harry could be drunk driving when he comes crashing into Peter's life. Harry only knows how to buy love, so maybe in return he keeps trying to gift Peter expensive objects and cannot understand why he refuses them. Why they don't mean all that much to him. Their friendship can blossom through that and throughout the season. I'd like to see the ways their fathers, Ben and Norman, raise them, love them, to be the thing that separates them as the series continues. I'd like to get an entire 40 minute episode called Emily, where we see how kind and loving Harry's mom was, how even Norman before her death wasn't that cold a father. It's her passing that tore his relationship with his son apart. Every time Norman looks at Harry, he sees Emily. Her eyes, her smile, the best parts of her are in their son. And that was too painful for him. So he coldly sent Harry away, school after school, training exercise after training exercise. Anything to avoid having to be reminded of his greatest loss. On the flip side of that, every time Aunt May sees her fall in love in Peter, she is filled with pride. After Ben died, she wanted nothing more than to hold on to Peter, onto the best parts of Ben, and take care of him as long as she could. Harry and Peter are connected by loss. Every one of the main characters is in a sense. But these two were both created and will continue to grow or fall because of how they and their parental figures handled the loss of someone they loved so deeply. Harry desperately wants to believe in people the way Peter does, much like Mary Jane. And MJ probably relates to Harry's view on the world more than she does with Peter. Pete doesn't understand what it's like to not come from a loving home, in a way that Harry and Mary sadly do. And Peter, that schmuck, won't allow himself to truly relate, confide in anyone other than us, his invisible audience. I believe just that core dynamic has the potential to capture the audience for years and years throw in the Spider-Man stuff and you got my dream show. I think the villains here would keep coming back, reoccurring guest stars. In some ways, I like to believe that Spider-Man is, in a sense, buddies with a lot of these cronies. I mean, they see him more than his friends often do, and he can be his full self around them. There's always an aura of comfort and familiarity when Adrian shows back up, or Herman decides to rob another bank, or Flint is trying to go straight. I'd like to see the bigger threats be given their due, like crazy. Imagine him coming in and tearing apart ESU's campus looking for Spider-Man. That's an entire episode right there, a suspenseful game of cat and mouse where Peter is the prey and everyone in the hunter's way is being impaled, maimed, and disposed of. Since this is a more intimate show, he doesn't need an army of Craven goons for Spider-Man to pound through. Think of Craven here like Bane, one unstoppable, terrifying force with the singular goal to break Peter. The thrill of the hunt is showcased through a one location suspenseful as all fuck episode where Peter has to make it back to his apartment off campus in order to try and stop him. What bullshit excuse can Peter think of since Mary and Harry are both with him, scared for their lives? Will Mary Jane cop to the fact that she probably knows he's Spider-Man? Will Harry find out? Will Flash Thompson get a spear through the knee because of Pete? I don't know. So much could happen, man. Fuck. I'd like to see the Green Goblin slowly introduced, letting Norman's character slowly unravel himself. Or is it Norman? Perhaps we think for a long time that Harry is the one behind the mask. And yes, mask, no more Power Ranger or monster. A modernized version of the classic Goblin costume could be so freaking scary. And he should be. Goblin has the potential to be Spider-Man's Joker, unhinged, terrifying, creepy, his laugh lurking in every shadow, ready to strike like a demon from hell. I'd like to have palpable passion be 
on display from the stylish lighting to the authentic grit of New York. I'd like to see swinging sequences that aren't just trying to recapture the magic of 2002 but are evolved for 2024. I think the creativity that could come from not having $200 million worth of tools at your disposal would be insane. Daredevil has the best action sequences in the MCU, some of the best in any superhero media, and one episode of Daredevil budget-wise equates to one lunch on a Spider-Man movie set. 13 episodes, 8 episodes, 5 episodes does not matter. You get the right creative team, the right people behind and in front of the camera, and the potential is limitless. This is the kind of long form in-depth storytelling that the comics have always offered and that a few hour film cannot. And I know I'm not reinventing the wheel with any of these ideas. I'm pulling from all my favorites and trying to inject the kind of rebellious punk energy I think modern day Spider-Man needs. The same kind of rebel energy and angst that Steve Ditko and Stan Lee infused the character with way back when. But alas, this will never happen, at least probably not in my lifetime. Spider-Man, Peter, Miles are too popular for something this, I don't know, different to be made right now. I think there's so many adaptations, universes, Madam Web movies happening right now that Sony definitely ain't thinking about a young adult series starring a brand new cast of actors. But it's fun to think about, right? I know I had fun writing this. I love sharing this stuff with you guys because my first love will always be storytelling. Whether that's writing a script, filming a movie, or just dreaming up a ideas for the characters that continue to save us, even if my friend Pete is doing just fine without me. Hey, thank you so much for watching. I loved, loved writing this one, and I can't wait to see what that one doesn't count does in the edit. So thanks, man, for editing this video, and thank you guys for watching. Um, I don't really have anything else to say right now, but let me know what you think. What's your dream Spider-Man story? Do you hate the, these ideas? Uh, you probably do. Maybe you don't. That'd be cool, right? Uh, I'm just fucking around. Okay, have a lovely, lovely, lovely day. Bye.